Oh. <laughs> Holy smokes. Look at that. This is incredible. This summer we had a visit from our friends Neil and Jelsey from Fire Willow Farm over in Longmont. They wanted to come out to the valley and they stopped around and visited a few folks, but over there they run something called the Laughing Coyote Project where they teach wild crafting skills to children and young teens. And I was really excited to show them all of the wonderful things that we have growing around this riparian area where the beaver ponds are behind me here on the farm. Who are you guys? Um, my name is Neil. Jelsey. Jelsey, we're from the Laughing Coyote Project. Um, we're excited to just be looking around this farm and um, come into this plant here. This is one of our favorites. Uh, this is Thule, um, which is a rush. And this is an incredible basketry material. In fact, it's what my hat is made out of. Um, and we wait, we've all sorts of baskets out of it. It was a really important resource for cultures in the Great Basin and in, into California making everything from baskets to boats to uh, decoys for hunting ducks. Yeah, this is a super cool plant. If one is going to make something like your hat, yeah. describe the process, if you would, of, of from harvest to usage. Yeah, absolutely. So I like to wait a little bit longer into the fall before we harvest. This one's just starting to turn yellow, but you want the tips to start yellowing. That way we know they're really solid. All the cellulose is formed. So typically September, October, we'd come in here and you just go and harvest as low as you can, just cut it with your knife and make bundles. At that point, we like to let it really dry and cure. And that way, once it's dry and cured, you can store it in a shed or barn for years, potentially, as long as it's taken care of. When it's time to weave, you make some sort of a container, could be a stock tank or even just some logs with a tarp in there that will hold water or a pond like this and you re-soak the materials. You soak them for probably 48 hours or so, and then you pull them out of the water and wrap them up in plastic or burlap or something and let them just sit, and that way they get really wilty. And at that moment, they're ready to then weave and be really pliable. How much working time once you've read it, would you say? Um, so once I've got it in that, we call it mellowing when you wrap it up in plastic, that would probably be about 24 hours. So I'd be soaking it close to 48, 72, 48 hours, and then, uh, and then let it mellow for 24 hours, and then you're good to go. Nice. And then as you're making a basket, it's good to keep water on hand because you'll want to periodically re-soak it because as it dries, it will become brittle again. Right. Um, so you keep it pliable as you're working. Now, if you imagine yourself in a survival situation, cordage is king. If you can make cordage, then you can lash uh, poles together to build shelter. You can make a bowstring for an improvised bow. There are endless usage for having a good rope at your disposal. And so this technique that uh, Chelsea is about to demonstrate here is a lost but fundamental skill to being a human being. That's really nice. Oh. <laughs> Holy smokes, look at that. This is incredible. So this is, this is a fiber plant. So what we have here, because it wants to split into four, what we have here are the fibers that want to come off. This is super rushed. And there we have, so there's the inner core, and then you can just peel it back and split and keep peeling it back and splitting. And then this is how you can separate that fiber from the inner core. And you want it to be last year's growth. Um, if you're gonna harvest it directly off the landscape. But so here we've got this incredible fiber and then there's this little skin on the outside which doesn't ever really bother me when I'm working with cordage. But you can kind of work your way through and just separate it. And then we get this really beautiful orangish red fiber. If you have a lot of it, you can kind of take it in your hands and pull it off. 
But then from here, you can just make cordage. And how I like to do that is I'll give it a little twist, make a little loop, and then I do, I twist it away. I grab the bottom bundle, half a twist towards, and I'll just keep doing that motion. Until we have cordage. Fantastic. So dogbane, also known yeah. as Indian hemp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, you yeah. can identify it by the red stalk, beautiful yellow leaves in the fall, twin pods. So this is a leguminous plant as well. Toxic to dogs, but fabulous for cordage. But mm. look at this. I mean, what's so particular about this is just the size of this. Like it's gotten so much moisture that when you think about how much cordage you can get off of this one plant and then the first branches like start up here you get these beautiful long fibers and you get a lot of it and so this you could come in here and take some of these older stalks you can see the very very old stalks this is not as structurally sound so you can see it's already peeling off right in desperation you could use that but it's already starting this would actually be really good for like a tinder bundle for mm -hmm. fire making you could harvest all of this and it's ready to go because it's super, super fluffy. But for cordage, not structurally sound enough. So and if we wanted to optimize for cordage... You would harvest um, You would harvest in the fall. Yeah, and then just come in and you cut it nice and low. And you could actually just sort of clear cut this whole area. Right. And then encourage it to come back and then you just have new growth every year. Um, yeah what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> but this is freaking amazing. I've never yeah. seen it this tall and Yeah, this it's is like, awesome. It's and so this cool. one is the variety. It tends to want to like branch out a little bit more, but because it's so tall, it's not branching till really, really yeah. high. So oftentimes if it's not like doesn't have enough moisture or the earth isn't healthy or whatnot, then it's just gonna be shorter, it's gonna branch shorter, and then you get these short little stalks that you're working with versus this incredible long thick. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, really That's awesome. so cool. Okay, cattails. All right, yeah, this is just an incredible resource. I mean, there's so much of it right here, but this is a really good one because we can find it in so many different environments. And so it's a really good plant to get to know well. Um, yeah, this is cattail. This is broadleaf cattail. Um, and, you know, in a lot of the old foraging books, they talk about this being the supermarket of the woods. It has all of these uses. Um, in my opinion, a lot of those uses take a lot of work. <laughs> you can you can harvest starch out of the, the rhizomes and, and things like that. But And it's cool to do, but in my opinion, some of my favorite uses of cattail are to use it for basketry. Um, this is another one that I'd be harvesting in the fall. Once it starts yellowing a little bit more, dry it really well. And then for making baskets, it's the same process as Thule where you're going to soak it for 48 hours or so, and then um, mellow it in a, in a tarp or some burlap. And so, yeah, this is just an incredible resource. There's so much of it. This can also be used in a primitive shelter building scenario. It makes great thatching. Mm. Um, again, I would be harvesting it later in the season so that it doesn't shrink as much when I thatch with it. And then one of our favorite culinary uses is to harvest the pollen. Uh, that's just a special treat and uh, and it's just a brilliant color. You can, you know, substitute in some of your flour and baked goods and, and that's a really beautiful resource. Um, very highly nutritious. Yeah, so cattails for days in here. Well, and these heads are so thick like when you look at them now so back in the spring when they were just pollinating they probably had so much pollen on them yeah. they were and, loaded yeah yes. where yeah. you just walk through and you just see these poofs yeah. of yeah. um yellow and so what the way that you would harvest for pollen is like if this in the spring when this is all full then you just come through and you cut them and then maybe you have some sort of a basket or something that you put them in and then you take them back to the house or some place where the wind isn't going to affect them and a jar or some sort of bucket and you just shake it 
in the bucket. You just kind of tap it on the edges and then you put it down and you kind of work your way through one by one. And then the next day you'll come back and you do that again. And sometimes you can do that up to three to four times. Nice. And so you don't actually, you know, then you're not in the marsh trying to get the pollen and the pollen is going everywhere and the wind is blowing it. Right. And this is like a very controlled way. And it doesn't take, especially with how fat these are, it wouldn't take that many. Yeah. Um, to get, get a, a decent of amount pollen. of pollen and oh my God, and yeah. pancakes and bread and it's such a yeah. beautiful color. And, and then tinder, of course. Tinder, oh, yeah. absolutely. Last year's. Extender. It's great. Uh, we use it as what we call coal extender. So it helps make a, an ember larger, especially with friction fire. Um, the other one is before they start exploding, they make a pretty decent torch. So you right. dip that in animal fat. Um, it makes a good torch too. Quite a useful plant. And then Absolutely. back behind here, do you see all this duckweed? Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, at least for basketry, which is what I love willow for, <clears throat> what I'm looking for is this first one year growth. So, it was cut at some point last year, I'm assuming. This was um, the pig pen last year. Okay, so perfect. So, they took everything down and then it grew. And what you get is this really beautiful single stalk. It has leaves on it, but it doesn't have branches. And for basketry, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so this fall, once all of the leaves drop, what I would do is I would just come in and I would re-clear cut this entire area. Um, and then it's very similar to the tule process and the cattail process where um, once it's cut, then you sort it. And that, that takes a little bit more than tule and cattail. You want to sort it by size. Um, and then from there, you um, do this kind of curing stage. So once it's sorted by size, you bundle it, you want to tie it nice and tight so that they stay very straight in the drying process. Um, and then you let it cure and, and it just sits there and it sits and it dries and you take all the moisture out of it so that then when you're ready to weave with it, um, you select the sizes that you need according to the project that you're working on um, and you soak it and kind of the rule of thumb is that you want to soak it uh, essentially one foot of material forget, gets soaked one day so if you have a four <laughs> foot piece you want to soak it approximately four days i find that here in colorado i have to soak it a little longer yeah things are just a bit drier here in general um and then there's the mellowing stage and that's 24 to 48 hours where you take it out of the water wrap it in a uh, tarp and then um and then you're just kind of letting the rest of that moisture absorb into the material. And then from there, you can just check it. And as long as it's really willowy and bending and not doing any cracking, then you're ready to weave with it. Um, and that is, that's, yeah, my realm. Um, but this is really beautiful stuff in here, actually. So as we walked around the farm, looking at all the good things to see here, Chelsea proceeded to perform a magic trick, which came out something like this. lovely yeah it's really really nice so go over and check out uh, laughing coyote project at laughingcoyoteproject.org and you can see all of the courses and things that they offer over there uh, they're doing really great work in terms of, of reviving some of these uh, almost lost skills and uh, they're really good educators and i highly recommend that you check out what they're doing if you're in the boulder area and you have young children consider getting them into these programs they'll learn life skills that have been forgotten but are eminently valuable mm -hmm.